So, um, hello, I am Arnav, I am uh, still a third year engineering student. So, uh, I am going to talk about uh, hacking the Android OS code. So, uh, by the way, before I begin, I would like a quick uh, show of hands for a couple of things. Uh, how many of you have uh, developed Android apps before? I can know about the process, so everybody. Uh, how many of you have ever worked with or experienced working with the OS code, the AOSP as we call it? So, yeah. And so, for these four or five people, I think at the beginning it will be a little boring. Uh, so, let's uh, start uh, by, you know, understanding the Android OS in the beginning. Uh, I will, uh, the slides will go on for like 15, 20 minutes. After that, we'll start some hands-on codes. So, uh, before we begin, I want to just uh, uh, share a few things. Like, uh, this is a diagram that I think a lot of people have seen a lot of times. So, the, uh, the Android architecture diagram, basically. So, you have the applications, the application framework, the libraries, and the Linux kernel. So, at, at basically, at the bottom of this whole chart is the hard, your hardware. At the top of this chart is your user. This is how Android works. So, uh, uh, I'd like to just uh, give a bit of lowdown on these things like applications. Uh, when we are ta I'm talking about Android OS here, so I'm not talking about uh, even the apps that you get on the Play Store. Just the OS itself already has uh, quite a few apps. Like the ones you see in the launcher of a default device that you get, that's there. Other than that also, a lot of things are in the format of apps. That so, apps, as you can see, uh, it's written out there, it's uh, simple bundled into APKs, what all of you app developers have been doing. Uh, then, uh, just level below is your uh, system UI or the framework, all over that, whichever is handling the UI part. So, this uh, defines everything else, like how the buttons look, how the checkboxes look, how the switches look, how the navigation bar looks, how your lock screen looks. So, all of this... Uh, uh, is there in the system UI, which is basically the Android OS's abstraction layer for the graphical uh, side. Uh, then the other part of the frameworks is uh, basically your providers and APIs, which whenever you're developing apps, uh, everything is abstracted to you, all your hardware, like you want to access the sensors, so you have got some classes which are abstracting sensors to you, mm, uh, or you want to say, uh, access the display layer or whatever. So, all the APIs are provided to you, extracted from the bottom layer to the developer via these things. So, that's also the job of the framework. Uh, then, just below the frameworks is the runtime. Uh, runtime is, uh, till now, it was the Dalvik, which was very much like the Java virtual machine. Uh, so, now Android is shifting over to a newer runtime, which, uh, so, like, quote unquote, Google says it's more native. So, then uh, below that are the libraries. Uh, libraries can be of various types. Some of them are for, say, encryption uh, libraries you have. You have got libraries which handle the hardware, which are called a HL, hardware abstraction layer, uh, which is a set of libraries which allow you as the developer to access uh, the, the, the GPU, the, the sensors, the screen. Uh, then, uh, uh, finally, at the bottom is the kernel, which uh, when we say that uh, Android is based on Linux, so it is this layer that we are talking about, uh, the, one, uh, the, the part of the OS that actually runs the hardware. So, the kernel is uh, pretty much the default Linux kernel that is available. Uh, there are some changes, uh, like the implementation of memory and power management is different. Uh, but basically, uh, this is very much like the mainline kernel tree that you have for any device. If you have Linux available, it will be somewhat like that. So, uh, now we are going over to how you can build Android for your phone. So, how many of you uh, n know anything about it? Like, you have heard that you can build Android, you can download the source on your PC and you can build that. Have any of you looked at the instructions? I think some of you have. Yeah. So, uh, just like you can build apps, you can build the OS itself. Uh, more time, more energy, more space, a lot of things have to be invested a little more than app development. Uh, so, uh, these are the kind of uh, requirements that you need to build. Uh, as you can see on the a general, normal laptop can suffice for building. 
Uh, we are going to download, uh, I have a copy of the source, but I will show you how it's downloaded. That will do. This is the link that actually describes how that process is done. Uh, it will take a lot of space. There are, uh, in Lollipop, I think, there are 464 separate Git repositories, which all get downloaded and they get inflated in a directory structure. In shortly, I'm going to show how the directory structure looks like. Uh, finally, when you have to build, uh, there is a, there is a mammoth build directory which has uh, some 20, 25 different MK files, the make files which are uh, handling how all these parts are built. So it's like about 10 GB of source, a lot of parts selectively gets built and finally you have a 200, 300 MB image that you flash on your uh, device. So, so we are going to talk about what can we modify and how and when we are talking about that uh, at uh, DroidCon 2014, two of the most important tracks I felt were one about UI, UX and another about the hardware side. So when you want to modify the Android source, I think these two are the uh, biggest motivating factors. I mean, if uh, you are making a new tablet or a new phone, you might want to uh, differentiate your phone on the basis of uh, the software. So you might like to change the user experience. That is one side of it. The other side is uh, today we have a lot of different devices coming up. I mean, like even one year ago, it was only tablets and phones and tablets are just larger phones. So now we have got uh, smart wearables, Android is coming in cars, Android is going to come in home automation soon. So there will be a lot of devices which probably won't have a touch screen, uh, with which you probably won't interact the way you interact with a phone or a tablet. So you would want to modify Android in a certain way that you can use it. Like for example, if you have, uh, on a watch itself, uh, the, the Android Wear platform works much differently from how it works on a smartphone. But it is after all the core, it is the Android OS source itself. So how we can do that, and that will involve a lot of uh, the term we hackers call is porting. Porting means to getting the Android to work on a hardware, a new set of hardware. So uh, on the slides, I would like to show you mostly about the UI side, because I can show that, then I will, for the hardware side, I will move over to show how you can actually change the code and what you can change in the code. So, when you talk about the UI side, uh, if you have run some custom ROMs, you will see a lot of the changes are like in the contacts app, in the SMS app, in the settings app. These things are something that as an app developer is not going to be something new to any of you. It's just the exactly the same structure as you structurize your source for an APK. Like back in the Eclipse days, how you used to do, if you have moved to studio, it has a different structure of code, but it's like the SRC files, Java files go there, the REST files, it's exactly like that. And uh, the only difference is uh, the apps that come with the OS, they mostly, the directly the source you cannot build in a third party ID because they have some deep linking with the OS code. But the whole idea is pretty much the same. Uh, then comes the modifying of the framework which on the code side, I think you don't need any other knowledge other than the Java knowledge you have already for developing apps. But that is something that you have to build the whole OS every time you make changes because these are deeply integrated with the other part of the OS. So here is somewhere you can make changes. For example, uh, for uh, people who have, uh, anybody has developed any app for a specific device ever. Say if you want to build an app for a Samsung phone and you want it to be included as uh, the multi-window thing, so there is a particular API for that, right? So uh, if you're building your own OS, you can add APIs uh, over and above what uh, Google provides in the default Android source, so so that uh, sometimes people want to make an ecosystem of apps for themselves. So that's uh, one thing you can do here. Uh, then uh, comes the part about uh, modifying the the libraries which are going to access the hardware, and why exactly you might want to do is uh, one of the biggest examples is uh, what Cyanogen Mod does is they have an equalizer app. So to do true equalization, you need to have deeper access to your audio chip, uh, wherever you want amplification and all that. That's an example. If you want to uh, improve the performance of the camera also, uh, wherever you need to change how we are accessing the hardware. And finally, uh, the kernel modification is something that uh, I guess 
I mean, at a third party level, mostly people do it to add uh, CPU governors and all that stuff. But uh, if you're going to build a new device, this is something that's very important because uh, you probably will get uh, wh whoever is your SOC or your CPU vendor will probably give you a Linux tree which will boot uh, the normal Linux. So now you have to run the Android kernel on it, which has certain subtle differences from the Linux kernel. So uh, it needs a bit of uh, a bit of vast knowledge on the kernel side to be able to do this. So uh, I will show some uh, changes on the UI UX side. Very uh, quickly, I will go over them, and you can see on the UI UX side, what are the things that you can do? Uh, say, for example, this is some changes for a ROM called AOKP. So this is something. Uh, I think a lot of you know this exists on a lot of custom ROMs. Uh, so you can change the size of the navigation bar, you can make it transparent or something like that, and can uh, have change the number of buttons that's, uh, that are available in the navigation bar, and uh, uh, you can add some extra keys like left right keys on the navigation bar. Uh, the, 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 from the bottom of the screen you get a Google icon, so you can add some more apps out there. Uh, this is something interesting. You can modify the total uh, UI. Uh, so you can see this is the in ICS there was a tablet mode where your status bar and your navigation bar come to the same place. So maybe you can enable that on a phone so that people have more screen estate or something like that. These are quite a lot of changes that you can do. There's also something related to themes, uh, which is also a lot of uh, people who make phones they are doing. Like Sony has a very nice theming service, and obviously the custom community people they uh, they they are very interested in theming and all that. So there are a lot of uh, So uh, this is another nice thing that has been done. This is you can uh, compare it to what you have on a HTC phone. You can right from the lock screen you can launch some apps. So and this is I bet one of the best features that uh, somebody hacking with the Android uh, uh, OS code has come up with is the privacy guard. So how many of you people know what privacy guard is? Okay, so. As an app developer, you know what uh, app permissions are. I think everybody knows that. So say your app uh, takes permission for reading contacts because your app needs to read contacts. So if you, if you download an app from the Play Store and it has the permission to read your contacts and you don't want to give your contacts away to that app, what do you do? Any answers? You can uninstall that app. Other than that, no options. So this is a very deep rooted thing that has been done it you can selectively turn on and off access to various permissions for apps so that's nice right so for doing that you will have to go down to the layer in the frameworks where permissions are given so if a certain app has a permission so that means uh, the apis to read contacts will be uh, exposed to it but when it tries to read it, if via privacy guard you said that I won't give you permission to read your contacts, so it will get a blank contacts file. So you have to work it around that way because if you just say that no, I'm not going to show your contacts, the app will crash because the app is expecting something return. So it will just see your contact book is empty. Right. So even with the internet also, so if you say the internet is not connected, the app will say please connect to the internet or it will give a box like that. But if you say like internet is connected, but the speed is zero kbps. So these kind of a changes that you can do with the OS. So this is something this is very important for privacy conscious users. Uh, most of them are a uh, lot of UI based features that I mean. This is something a ROM called Paranoid Android did what they made an API to change the external UI of the phone based on what app you are running. So say you are running Facebook, your navigation bar becomes blue in color. You say run Google Plus, your navigation bar becomes red in color. Okay, so this is also some of the things uh, uh, that can make 
the user interface and the experience or how seamlessly user are, users are using the phone very different. Uh, then uh, what other things you can change is I can uh, show one of the modifications I did uh, while I was working on a project uh, for Micromax is this uh, oh, so I had an issue with the video. Uh, basically, uh, that's where the presentation ends. So, uh, I will move on to how you can actually get the source code and you can build it. So, uh, firstly, uh, let's uh, see, I mean, you will need to search the internet for that actually. So, that's why uh, if, I'll do is I'll mirror my screen so that I can show you. Yeah, so uh, the link that I showed in that slide was how Google gives you instructions to build Android on your uh, on your laptop. But as a personal suggestion, I would say if you search uh, this thing, uh, build Android lollipop on Ubuntu, I search this, and one of the first results is a XDA thread. So I personally would suggest this because there are certain steps that Google misses. So uh, this has a lot of instructions, like you need to get the OpenJDK. Uh, another thing you can note. If you want to build something before Lollipop, you will need the Sun Java uh, JDK, which you can get only from Oracle's site. You won't get it via any updates on Ubuntu. Uh, and the first thing I think I didn't mention, you cannot build on Windows. You will need a Mac or a Linux. And for anything above ICS, you will need it 64 bit to be able to build. Okay. So you will need a few tools in the beginning. You will need, like I said, Java. Anything below uh, Lollipop, you will need Java 6, and the Open JDK 6 won't do. You won't be able to build with Open JDK 6. You will need the Sun JDK 6. Uh, then, for Lollipop and for any future version, you will need 7. Uh, you will need like Python. You will need Git, and uh, this this is a whole list of packages that you will need. Just copy that list and paste it, and install all of them before you start building. Uh, then, uh, as you can see, like th this is a very comprehensive information set. Whatever kind of uh, OS you're using, 12.04 or 13.04, they, they have even uh, instructions for Mac and all that. Uh, so you will have to follow these instructions. Get this pa the tools that you need. You will need to get it ready. And uh, another thing is, uh, how many of you have uh, used ADB on Mac or Linux? Have had driver issues? Yeah, so this also, I mean, something uh, not just related to Android OS development. If you are an app developer, you might have faced this issue. You could have solved this UDEV rules. You have to do this also. Uh, and uh, so now we move on to the part where we are going to get the source. So like I said, the source is available. Uh, like this is, uh, you can note this down. You can see this android.googlesource.com. This is the website where the source code of a whole of Android where Google publishes it. Uh, as you can see, there are a whole lot of repositories. All of them are separate uh, Git repositories. So to download them, Google has made this nice little uh, script called repo, R-E-P-O, repo. So you have to do this uh, step, uh, curl, HTTPS storage, googleapis.com, git repo, download repo, and uh, it will uh, come on to your bin folder. There will be this uh, script called repo. So what this does is, uh, this is going to this is help you download the whole source and inflate you, inflate it in the particular order in the directories where you need it to be able to build the Android OS. Okay. Uh, how many of you uh, have that source code right now? Show of hands. Uh, okay. That's uh, quite a few people. Uh, but uh, how many of uh, you have access to internet right now? So, uh, I would like, uh, 
wherever you don't have source, I will uh, show the place on the internet where you can see the source. That's as good as that. Uh, the source code when you download it will be 25 GB in size because it has all the history right from Android 1.0 to this. So you will have to download the whole thing because if you want to keep in sync with the updates that Google does to the source code. So that's the best way to do it. Is some, to some people I have uh, distributed a tar file of the source. But the tar file you cannot update it uh, via git. Uh, so uh, you, after you get uh, the repo script, uh, you should make a directory and you can make it anywhere. Uh, sometimes a lot of people ask uh, if that's possible or not. Yes, it's possible like I have it set this way. I have a folder called Android inside that I have got AOKP is one of the custom ROMs I work on and this is the KitKat source, the lollipop source I'm yet to download. Inside that you run this command uh, which is uh, Showed on a terminal. So uh, the command is visible. It's like repo init u, and then wherever you're getting the source from, and it will have a branch because if you want to and download a lollipop source, you have to the branch like this. So for example, instead of uh, the AOSP source I want to get the cyanogen mod source so it will be it will become the line will become something like okay so what exactly exists here so let's have a look at that So this repo will have a file like this. Uh, I yeah, so it's visible now. So this has basically a list like this. The path shows where the source goes, then the name shows from where the git repository it will come from, and then sometimes they can have a group and a revision which source it's going to download. So it's a long list. Like I said, all those 464 different Git repositories, they are mapped like this. So you do this step, your repo gets initialized, and then you have to run the command to sync it. When you do this, the whole download of that 25 GB of source, it will start. Okay, if you have a good connection, you can do J20, say 20 parallel downloads will start. If you are having any issues, uh, like if the connection is breaking a lot, repo gets hung, so you can use the force flag. If any of the repositories are not downloaded, it will skip and continue with the others. So you can check out all the other arguments that repo has. After you have downloaded it, the source should look like this. Uh, so is that visible? I mean, these. Uh, Tar files are not part of the source. The folders are. So I, I would like to uh, give a brief description of what exactly the source means. Okay. So I'll start with some of the most uh, important folders first. Uh, so let's uh, say ART is the new runtime, as you know. So this has all the source code of the runtime. Uh, we will delve into it later. Dalvik is the older runtime. Uh, then you have inside the bootable folder, uh, this is something that is going to interest the people who uh, probably want to get Android running on a new hardware. So it will have the bootloader. This is the source of a reference bootloader, okay. So this is not the source of the bootloader that comes on the Nexus devices. Because as a equipment manufacturer, you need your bootloader to be secure. Uh, you not want your bootloader to be open source. Uh, you would want that if somebody wants to flash their custom firmware on it, they should unlock it via some like fastboot OEM unlock is a method you can do it. So like that, but this is a source code of a reference bootloader. The bootloader, as you all know, it's going to uh, start up all the other systems. Then uh, another thing is uh, the recovery. Uh, recovery allows two things. One is 
obviously as the name suggests if something goes wrong you can data wipe your device from the recovery you, you can uh, reflash uh, a new build via the recovery and finally a uh, recovery helps you in fota every uh, so you know what fota means firmware over the air like you get upgrades to your android uh, if you have a phone you get upgrades which are like say uh, the uh, your ROM that comes with the phone by default for a, for a OEM like Samsung, Sony who do their own UI, it will be 700, 800 MB in size, but your updates are generally 100 MB or something like that. So it's a delta diff of it. Uh, so these updates you want to install it on the fly, that also what happens is the phone reboots into recovery mode. So in the recovery, your system partitions, your data partitions, they are not mounted. Your recovery updates your phone and then it again boots back into the normal mode. So for that you have the recovery. Uh, on the recovery side, uh, the community uh, in the community, a lot of people have developed a lot of recoveries. Uh, the Android recovery is very simple. You can just flash files and it does not have a touch interface. You use the volume buttons to go up and down and a power button to reboot. There are people who have developed touch screen uh, recoveries. Uh, the phones that come with Cyanogen mod on board like the Oppo N1 and this uh, the OnePlus and now the U phone is going to come out. They have a touch screen based recovery that Cyanogen has developed. Uh, so this is about the recovery. Uh, then uh, the build folder, I will come to it at the end because this helps you build everything. Uh, this is all the build configurations. The CTS folder is something, uh, it contains a lot of test suits that you need to pass to be able to consider Android certified, officially Android certified. Uh, so let's uh, skip on directly to the folder called the device. So inside device, as you can see, I uh, build a lot of custom ROMs for Sony devices. So it's a device, Sony, and uh, this Yuga stands as a code name for the Xperia Z phone. Okay, so these, uh, these contain configuration files for how uh, the Android OS source code, how it will be built. So for example, inside this folder, uh, so uh, for example, if you want to build Android for a new device, you will have to create something like device slash the, your vendor name slash your device name. And inside this folder, you will have uh, some certain uh, uh, preset uh, make files. So you will have your uh, android.mk, it's very standard template. This needs to be there under every uh, separate module that gets built. You will have something called Android board.mk. Again, this file needs to exist to uh, to tell the Android build system that this device has its own board. Okay, uh, this tells the uh, this Android products.mk redirects to the make file where you are going to define all your configurations. And then the board config file. Uh, so in Android. When we talk about the word board, board generally means anything that relates to the kernel. When you talk about the device, you're talking about the Android part of it. Okay, so you, the whatever changes you are doing on the Android side, the board generally, so here, uh, how many of you have ever uh, experienced working on the Linux kernel or build the Linux kernel or seen the source? Show of hands again. So, okay, so not a lot of you. So this, uh, s certain flags like this are going to set which configuration your kernel will be built in. I'll go to the kernel side again. So uh, your device will have uh, certain uh, uh, parameters like the size of the boot, the size of the recovery, the size of the system and the user data. These have to be defined here, like you can see. Uh, then, uh, this is going to define how the Android side is going to be built. So like we have defined the height and width of the system. Uh, we are going to define the basic make file that is going to be taken. So here taking a full base telephony.mk, there are a lot of uh, product files like this in the default build folder. So this is a phone that has got GSM on it. So I, I, I'm going to inherit the full base telephony.mk. So this is going to have the basic needs for a device which has GSM on it, a uh, phone or tablet kind of device, for example. Uh, then I'm going to inherit whatever is specific to my device. Okay, and then I set the name, the device, 
So this, uh, for example, uh, you have written the product model. This is what comes up in the about phone screen. So what device you're building it for. Uh, then there. So, uh, after that, there is the the external folder is for a lot of uh, binaries that are present on your phone, which are not part of the Android project per se. Like you can see here, there is uh, there are binaries for say. Uh, Apache, there is for Apache, there is for Bluetooth. So these are all sources that are part of the open source community. A lot of them are from the GNU project. So whatever needs you need for like uh, supporting web servers, supporting encryption, supporting your hardware, whatever different sources that uh, will be needed, they are mostly here. Uh, most of them are uh, based on C or C++ because these are low level codes, these are, these are what you have in the Linux project or the GNU. Then uh, there's the frameworks folder. So this really when we uh, talk about the Android platform, most of the code is in this folder, okay. Uh, if you want to have a, a look at what are the things I'm showing here, what you can do is, uh, you can either go to this site, Okay, this android.googlesource.com and you can uh, search out the source that I am uh, showing like. Uh, there will be, those of you who have internet, you can search out like uh, this frameworks, AV frameworks base, all the frameworks source uh, that I'm showing from my laptop. You can see the exact same source available on the net. Either this or you can also use a mirror, it's github.com slash android, it's more cleanly presented on github. So here also, uh, say, I'll search. There's a frameworks base, this is the main platform source. You can look around here, I will just show it on my own desktop. So the uh, frameworks has uh, a lot of uh, files, say AV is where you have all the audio and the video related code, there is a DRM related code. So framework uh, is the initial diagram that I uh, showed. The framework is a layer between your libraries and your apps. So it needs to talk to the libraries via obviously some lower level languages like C, C++. And it needs to, uh, it needs to talk to your apps via some Java abstraction. So your framework you will see most of the pl f f places it is divided into the Java source and the native source with a JNI mapping across it. Uh, so whatever uh, the the main function of the framework is like it's translating whatever you're doing in Java into some lower level system calls. So, for example, uh, there is uh, your media server code here. As you can see, these are all C codes. So these are uh, again important like, these are APIs to your uh, hardware. As uh, if you want to go into uh, like change the hardware side, if you want to build Android for a new device, you will have to, you will have to often uh, change the code here because these are calling the direct uh, functions in your uh, hardware libraries. So your hardware libraries, say for example, you are making a new device which has a camera chip that has not been used on Linux before, uh, Android before. So you will write your camera binary for it. Uh, so it can have functions which are not similar to what is present on uh, the generic camera chips you have on uh, previous Android devices. So uh, you will have to come uh, up here at the, you will have to obviously, you have to write the device driver for Linux first and then you will have to change whatever calls it makes to the camera from the frameworks AV side so that it like uh, changing say the brightness or the exposure of your camera. So if your fun whatever the function calls are there on your binary, you will have to adjust it accordingly here. Uh, the Base is something that has a lot of stuff here. So this file, 
holds a list of all APIs that are available on Android. Okay. So, uh, during the Lollipop announcement, uh, they said that they have added 5,000 new APIs. Uh, you noted that. So, when they said 5,000 new APIs, they mean that the number of lines on this text file, I mean not the number of lines, but number of uh, APIs on this file that incremented by 5,000. So, here uh, all your flags, all your function calls, they are all documented out here. Uh, the CMDs are the processes uh, like uh, the whatever Android has added, uh, which are low level stuff like you know, uh, this is the screen cap is what, uh, this is your file that is used to uh, record your screen, uh, which was added in KitKat recently. Uh, so, inside uh, frameworks base, uh, again I uh, will be talking about uh, say for example, uh, the core side, this has all the, uh, the frameworks base core Java, this has most of the classes that you extend when you are working on Android. Okay, you uh, say for example, you are extending your activity class. So, the source of that actually resides up here, activity.java. So, what uh, exactly can you do here is uh, some of an important thing I would like to show. So, here is a uh, particular function you can see here. This was not present on uh, and AOSP by default, okay. So, we have this uh, uh, community project called AOKP which is just like cyanogen mod. So, this is a particular uh, line and the uh, update immersive mode the function has been added. What it does is, uh, so you can uh, see my phone. Uh, by the way, uh, everybody knows immersive mode is, they have heard of it in KitKat, uh, with immer it's immersive mode is a API that if you call it, your app becomes full screen and uh, I will show what immersive mode is, this happens, your sorry, navigation bar goes down, you can pull it up like this, uh, in any app you go, so or it becomes full screen like you see and you can pull down all of this. Okay, so this as an app developer is available to you as an API. So what we did was we changed it in the activity.java file, which every activity, every uh, every app is extending it. So when I have immersive mode on across the whole OS, so every app is extending the activity.java, which is part of my system. So all the apps uh, are becoming in immersive mode. Okay. So, this is an uh, example of uh, say when you want to change the user experience or the interface across all, all apps, say you want to change the themes and all. So, you have to go down to the basic base implementation which everybody is extending, change it globally and for everybody it changes. So, using that uh, when we talk about what we can do improvements on uh, the the yeah, UX side is, well, this is not actually, this is just experimenting with it, okay. So, when you say how do you change the experience, how you change the experience is, uh, you create a list of apps that users can update, which will automatically become immersive, okay. So, we have that and what you can do is, you can add the apps that you want into your auto immersive list. So, whenever those apps run, they will run on full screen, whether or not the app developer wanted it. So, you give power to the user to uh, decide when some of the apps should run in full screen or not. So, suppose uh, you want, uh, uh, the, uh, you as a user want to use full, uh, uh, Facebook full screen all the time. So, you make Facebook as an auto immersive app. So, every time Facebook opens, it's always full screen. Uh, then, uh, let's, uh, Let's go to uh, the, 
So you have this folder called packages here. Okay, so this contains a lot of apps which are part of the default system. So for example, you have uh, the key guard which makes your lock screen, you have the system UI which is your whole the shell, you have documents UI which is in uh, KitKat, they have added a new file browser kind of interface when you want to attach files you have this uh, nice looking file browser now. So these apps are there. Uh, so for example, uh, everybody knows that these uh, custom ROMs make these uh, toggles right, much before Android had quick settings, you still have toggles for example. So how you do that is like in system UI, you can go and so we'll have your status bar. This is the code that is going to uh, run your uh, this this code compiles into your status bar. So you can change uh, this. You have a toggles folder. You make a toggles folder. What you do is this toggles folder. Any of the files that are in the toggles folder, they are going to create toggles. So you add a lot of toggles. So you can toggle a lot of stuff in this, uh, these are things that we have added, like we have added a toggle to take a screenshot, a toggle to switch on off NFC, a toggle to switch between the various network modes, 2G, 3G, 4G, like that. So again, this uh, can enhance the user experience, if you add too many toggles it can be an irritation also, but so that again is something up to your purview how you are going to do it. So that was about the frameworks, okay, uh, let's, uh, since I'm talking about the UI, I will stick to that for a couple of more minutes and see, uh, finally, if you want to change uh, the apps that are part of the OS, uh, say for you, uh, example, you want to change how the dialer works, for example, so they are all in the packages apps folder and this part actually you can do. I mean you will have to build the OS to be able to modify the ROM image, but as a developer if you just want to change the phone app, you can just get one of these folders, you can download, each one of them is a separate git repository, you can download it. Uh, so I will tell you something interesting. Uh, If you go and uh, try to uh, build this, it, it will fail to build if you do it on something like Eclipse or on uh, Studio, it won't build because uh, the APIs, uh, there is a concept of hidden APIs, if some of you have worked on some apps like say, before KitKat if any of you wanted to work on an app that handles SMS in Android, so these APIs were not exposed directly. So you go into the OS code, you look at how Android's own SMS app works and you call the related functions, but it's not all that easy to compile it because your SDK does not have all those APIs exposed, okay. So for that I have written a Oh, sorry. Yeah. So here's a, a script that I had written. What this does is, it can create a, a SDK which has all the hidden uh, APIs on it. So you can directly uh, take uh, this script for example, so whatever APIs are needed, uh, uh, all of you Android developers you know, there's an android.jar file inside the SDK, so every platform has a different android.jar inside which you get all the stubs of all the methods that are present in the system. So this script 
it is available on uh, this uh, github.com slash aokp slash build folder and inside uh, tools uh, custom sdk gen dot sh so uh, yeah. what this uh, script does is uh, for the first time you will need to have the whole os code inside the build folder if you run this uh, script it will create an android dot jar for you uh, with all the hidden apis in it so you can create a new platform in your uh, sdk folder so like uh, if you have your you know there are like android 18 android 19 android 20 21 these are all the sdks what you can do is you can create a new platform say you're uh, creating the hidden apis of kitkat create a new platform called android 119 for example okay copy the android 19 folder make it android 119 inside there will be a property file change 19 to 119 and replace the android.jar file that you find it here uh, with the android.jar that my script generates. So then you can uh, simply build, uh, you can modify the default OS apps on your favorite ID because that's comfortable, right? So you can do it on your ID and it will compile also. Okay, and it will work on your system as such. So that's something that, uh, I mean, these are the kind of little hacks you need to do to be able to comfortably work on because I personally feel that, you know, with when I am working on Java, I prefer an ID. <laughs> so here, uh, these are, this is a list of say the default apps that you have. Uh, some of the apps that I feel I, uh, for a UX perspective that people like changing are like, for example, the dialer, the MMS app, and there are something that uh, pertains to sometimes the hardware side also because it's the NFC app and all that. So now let's uh, get to the hardware side, okay. This is about, I told how you can change the user experience. But for example, if you want to build a new platform, you want to build a new device. So first of all, this is the hardware folder inside which you need, uh, there is a source code for all the different hardware that's present on your device, the, the, the device drivers like we call them. So, uh, mostly for say, a Qualcomm based device, you take the uh, uh, source code of the media side, the display, the audio, all of that from Code Aurora forums. So, you can, uh, see there is a, There's this website called Code Aurora Forums. So here there is a reference source code available for everything that's based on Qualcomm. Similarly, most other SOC or CPU manufacturers will have a particular website where they give out their reference codes. So you'll have to take that source code. And generally, if you are building a new device, for example, so you can start off with AOSP, uh, whatever uh, Code Aurora has been adding. Uh, for example, for Qualcomm, if you do for other device, you get your hardware code. This should, this should be where you start from. Uh, that is one thing you have to do. Uh, like I said, you have to uh, obviously go into, uh, you have to create a device slash vendor slash your device name folder. Uh, you will have to set up all your uh, configurations. AOSP as such uh, is not going to build your kernel along with the main build, okay. So you can build the kernel separately and provide it as a pre-built or you can uh, use suppose for example Cyanogen mods build folder. So what that will do is it also builds the kernel along with the whole build. So the kernel gets integrated right during the time. So then you put your kernel inside say kernel slash vendor name slash your whatever chip you're using. This folder is something that you can name whatever you want to. Uh, Again, uh, uh, some other things that I would like to mention here are, uh, there, is, there is this folder called pre-builds. This contains all the cross compilers or binaries that you need to build. So when you're talking about uh, hardware side of things, uh, uh, the C, C++ side, they have to be compiled. Like if you compile it on Linux, it is going to be compiled for uh, this AMD 64 or uh, x86 architecture, x86 architecture. So you, you have uh, cross compilers which are going to compile C code for ARM so that you can run it on your device. You, 
right from your kernel to your device driver all native code. So, all uh, those stuff are present uh, and whatever other tools that you need some of the tools like uh, all those who have worked on the android app side would know about tools like uh, aapt which packages your uh, apks and zip align and PV. so these uh, tools are built on the fly actually so once uh, all of you who will actually uh, go home and try building it you will find first time you build it takes a lot of time because first uh, you are going to build the tools that you used to build and then you will actually build and uh, finally there is uh, this folder called a uh, vendor folder which uh, generally the reason we use it is uh, there are a lot of uh, parts of the system despite calling android open source there are certain things which are not open source for example your uh, your uh, soc manufacturer mostly will give some of things in binary format to you they won't give the source for that okay so there is uh, a good example is Qualcomm makes a library called libqc opt. It's, it's for Qualcomm based optimizations. You don't know what exists inside that, but if you run it, apparently your device runs uh, smoother. So for all those things, uh, there is a vendor folder. So here, as you can see, this is the structure of the system folder. So there are a lot of libraries here that directly these are they will just go into your phone's uh, system folder directly because these are uh, libraries which you will just link to. So the vendor folder is mainly used for uh, these purposes for the binaries that uh, you are not going to compile you keep it in a vendor folder they are directly copied to your uh, kernel uh, the ROM image. Okay, So let us uh, try building it I think uh, is this one visible? This is probably not visible at the back. I, I use the this terminal itself. Okay. So when we want to build, uh, this is given that the whole source code is present with you. After that, uh, you source a configuration file which is present at build slash env dot sh. This sets up your environment for building the uh, whole thing. Okay. You do this, uh, then uh, the go people at Google have very funny names. They call launching. When you launch it, so you make your environment ready for one particular type of device. Okay. So this is like uh, an embedded operating system. So this is not like uh, your OS distros that you can run on any kind of hardware. This, the, uh, this will be built specifically. If you build it for a particular phone, it will run on that phone because there are a lot of constraints you can you don't, don't want to use a lot of ram you don't want to add a lot of drivers you don't want to increase the size so you just build with only those things that are needed for that phone and that phone alone and not for other phones so uh, the launching uh, configures it according to the, your device you want to build so uh, for example uh, i have uh, my xperia z phone say i want to build for that uh, you, your if you just click launch and press enter you get a list of all the configurations that you have so uh, if you have got your make files all set up uh, then uh, to add to the launch menu you should uh, you can do it at two places either wherever you have the device thing device you can add a file called vendor setup.sh either there or you can have your own vendor uh, in the vendor folder you can have this uh, so this uh, runs a lot of commands to add whatever configurations you have like add lunch combo name of the device like that so this list comes up so I want to do it for the Xperia Z which is the Yuga so I am going to select number 66 so when I launch it it is going to reset all the various configurations at various places to build for this particular device why this is needed is uh, as app developers you will know that there is uh, this LDPI, MDPI, HDPI thing okay. So uh, you don't want to bundle all these resources unnecessarily for a phone which is say HDPI. You would not need the LDPI, MDPI resources if you have the HDPI resources. Exactly the same way for a LDPI phone you don't need the larger resources. So uh, this is one example there are a lot of other things like this. Uh, so the launching will take care of all these things that whatever particular configuration your device is off it is going to set the build uh, instructions in the respective way. 
after that this uh, this little information box will come it is going to tell you which version you are about to build whatever cpu architecture you have whatever host architecture you have and it is going to show the out uh, directory which is where the source code is going to uh, output into then there is the c cache directory people who have worked with c++ know about c cache how many of you don't know about c cache so c cache is like for c or c++ code uh, it is going to keep a cache of uh, when you build it first time it is going to keep a cache of your binaries next time when you build it uh, does a hash mapping and the source has not changed it is not going to build it again so creating a hash of a file is faster than compiling it right so uh, you should use c cache always when you are building a project as large as this because it is going to reduce your time significantly from the second build then uh, the simple command is make you can use a, a job variable to set number of threads that you have on your laptop or your build machine accordingly and it is going to build as per that okay so it's going to take a lot of time to build on my personal laptop i can run a build in the, this amount of time on my ssh server in, uh, instead so that has uh, i think 16 cores or something so i will show you whatever the output is from a build folder there uh, then uh, this is something that you do make and it creates the whole uh, source code okay but then uh, going forward you are not going to change everything all the time so you are changing it component by component so every module like i said is going to have a and everything that has a android.mk file is a separate module as per the build instructions okay so for example i uh, go to my any app uh, let's for example let's select an app packages apps and say my camera app so it will have an android.mk file and which will have a local package name okay this variable so uh, this defines that everything if all the source inside this folder is going to build into a module called camera2 so what i can do is i can run make so okay there are uh, two ways of doing this. this is called component by component building when you are going to change code this will be needed a lot there are two ways of doing it you can either uh, go to the folder like here you can run a command called mmm this command is available only after you have done the build slash environment setup you have uh, sourced it you will have a command called triple m and you can do just mmm here and it will be build camera but this will work only if all the dependencies are already satisfied but if you do make from out from the top then it is going to build whatever dependencies the camera package needs and then it is going to build the camera app okay this is one way to build depending on what source you want to build there is another way to build depending on what target you want to build so you can select something like make and for example the kernel is built at this path the out is the variable for the out folder inside that the kernel file is where your kernel comes out so you can do make out slash kernel and then it will build just your kernel file for you so this is by ties you are targeting it by what end product you want so beyond this uh, uh, see what you want to uh, build or what you want to change is something that uh, depends on what you want to do but uh, this pertains to a lot of the how about uh, you want to change things so i would like to know if uh, any other questions you have regarding how you want to build things because i'm not going to uh, cover anything further on the how part so i'd like to know if anything specific you want to know about how you want to build it any kind of questions you have uh, no questions about this part uh, how exactly you figure out where to go and change files for example you know that this is where the camera is is it every documentation for this or you just hack around and figure out where to go uh, mo mostly i do hack around and figure out okay so 
let's say for example, uh, you want to, uh, it does come a, a bit over time when you keep seeing other people changing stuff, you yourself changing stuff, you start learning where different code is. You have a basic idea like I give, see something about the device drivers, it will be in the hardware folder. So you go inside hardware folder, do a find grep and whatever thing you're searching for, you will probably find out that way. So uh, the base classes that you are extending for uh, changing the APIs, that will always be inside uh, frameworks base core, for example, okay. So the, uh, you get a rough idea like that, then you want to change a particular class, uh, so a dot java file you will have to do something like I want to find out name a common uh, file that is extended, any common java class that is extended while developing an app, yeah, activity.java, okay. So I want to search activity.java, I will go to I will just do find So we'll get uh, all the files, we wanted this file, right? So activity.java we find out like this. Uh, you got every other file that has ending with activity.java. Uh, so that's one way you find out w uh, what you want to change. Um, anything else? Yeah? Yeah? Kernel browsers, yeah. Uh, see the kernel structure will be very much like the Linux kernel, yeah, yeah? A kernel browser to like browse the source code of the Linux kernel. Yeah, but uh, the problem is the Linux kernel source code for every device is uh, quite different. So the Linux kernel browser works because there is a mainline tree of Linux kernel which is common to everybody, right? Yeah. So on the Android side, uh, See, ninety percent of the source is same as the Linux kernel. So your Linux kernel browser is giving uh, documentation and the particular places where you get the source code. That's going to hold true for ninety percent of the source code of the Linux ker Android kernel too. The ten percent that is different is implemented vastly differently for various different devices. Okay. So you got the idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, I want to see uh, browse through the code of uh, Qualcomm uh, CP devices. So maybe accept uh, the uh, audio uh, audio code, the video code and the CPU code, everything else is mainline Linux. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so any other uh, questions? Okay. So uh, the next thing that comes is obviously contributing the source code back. I think that's a lot of people were asking me when I was outside. Right? We have changed it, so how do we contribute it back? So for that, uh, uh, you know, a lot. I think they just give a sort of personal advice. A lot of people think that development pertains a lot to writing code. I feel that almost 50% of it is also getting acquainted with the tools that you need to do it. And one of them, the biggest ones is your version control system. So if you want to contribute back to Android, uh, to AOSP, or even if you want to contribute to some somebody like Cyanogen, you will need to have a very good uh, grasp over uh, Git, over how repo is used. Because uh, say for example, you change something, you push it up and then it's uh, in review, somebody says something, you change something. In between that, uh, something gets merged which uh, changes the code exactly where you were working. So you need to have a very good command over conflict uh, resolution and everything because uh, this is going to come up a lot. Uh, I, I remember like a friend of mine submitted a code to AOSP, it got merged <laughs> more than a year later. So two Android versions came out between that. But it was a system related code, so that part had not changed a lot. It was a bug fix, so it lied on the jerit of uh, the code review of uh, Google for more than a year and then it got merged. So obviously you need to uh, be expert in rebasing and conflict merging and all of that. So I will give a quick overview on how that is done. So there is this, uh, yeah, so this is the code review of uh, AOSP, this is on the URL android-review.googlesource.com. So I will uh, show something uh, like, so I want to make a change. So I am,
uh, this particular folder does not exist on AOSP, but what I am doing uh, the commands they are going to pertain to AOSP as well. So, here repo comes to help a lot. So, what you can do is say I am adding a file. So, I created a file called test inside this folder and this is for example, this is my change I want to contribute it. So, I do uh, what you do and generally get you um, add the file and then you do a commit of it. So, I have added a test file and I have committed it. So, uh, at this point of time what you can do is, uh, I am sorry I had to take a step before that. Uh, you have to do repo uh, start. So, when you uh, use the start command, it is going to start a development branch for you, ok, in the same folder. So, you do repo start, say I am going to, so you will have to start it with the same name of the branch into which you want to contribute, ok. So, I do repo start kitkat and in which folder in this folder, this is the, but so you see I am on the branch kitkat now, ok. So, I have to do the same, I have to do the same thing all over again, the test file is gone. So, I have added this test file now, so is a, this is the simple command that you use, uh, you, you use repo upload, okay. So, you can run this command after you have committed a lot of changes on a lot of different uh, sections of the code. So, repo will search through the whole android tree and in whichever trees there are uh, dangling commits, it is going to upload all of them to the respective review server, ok. For if you are doing on AOSP, for all the folders the re review server will be uh, the uh, go android's uh, review server. If you are working on some uh, custom ROMs or something, sometimes what happens is different uh, folders are taken from different uh, organizations. So, if you have worked across folders which are from different organizations, they will all upload it to their respective code review. Uh, how many of you know about uh, Gerrit or Gerrit G E R R I T? ok. So, Gerrit is the code review system that uh, Google started and a lot of people use now. They use it uh, in a large scale way for Android and for the Chromium project for code reviewing source. So, if you do not know about Gerrit, maybe some of you know about review board. So, Gerrit works in a similar manner. So, in some more questions, yeah sure. So, uh, then you do repo upload. Okay, I think there's a issue is uh, the internet here does not allow SSH access. SSH is not a report is blocked. Anyway, so if you uh, if I if that command got executed, what would happened was this is the Android's review. So uh, a commit like this would have been formed. Uh, I was uh, reviewing it to our uh, our project's Jerit, which also looks very similar to that. You have a list of commits that have come. So it would have come up somewhere like this. Ok. Uh, so, this whoever has the authority uh, will review it, uh, verify it and finally merge it. So, this is the way you contribute uh, uh, to a project. Ok. So, uh, I would like to open up for 10 more minutes for some questions uh, once again. So, any questions uh, regarding what I have said uh, till now or anything else, any questions? So. No questions? Fine. Ok, so what else do you want me to cover? That is a question from my side, yeah. Okay, when your phone gets? I think it is 12 ohms connection and yeah, yeah. 12 ohms right. 
Yeah, you do a serial connection and you give the power via the USB jack. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not reading. Uh, the so, when, when you do a mod uh, flash. You do mod flash, yeah. Yeah, at times it gets bricked. Right. At times it gets bricked, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Uh, those times you, you can actually power up the phone by uh, inserting an USB jack of uh, 6 ohms and serial connection. So, it actually gets sold on eBay. I so know, uh, it's uh, called the fast boot ca cable. Yeah, something like that. It's so, actually on that, the uh, USB has got right. 5 pins inside it. Exactly, yeah. So, you connect the phone to the ground, it becomes a fast boot cable. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. So, so uh, is it something like, uh, you know, official, then uh, why is it, uh, uh, the option is uh, something which you can avoid breaking itself? So you can avoid breaking it itself, okay. So, that's a nice question. Uh, so, how does the whole breaking thing come upon is, you know, as a OEM, people want to secure the ecosystem. Uh, because uh, tomorrow if you run a custom ROM and you get a bad experience, you can uh, you can go out and say that uh, XYZ OEM makes bad phones. So, because they don't want that to happen, is that is the main motivation I believe, they lock down. So, locking down means the bootloader is going to verify the signature of each system partition before booting it. Okay. So, if without a proper bootloader unlock, if you change the contents of the system partition, it will, won't boot. So that's one kind of uh, a brick, but that's a soft brick because you can rewrite the system partition probably again via some exploits Okay. and you can uh, uh, reboot your device. Uh, there can be hardware level uh, bricks also. Uh, when we talk about hardware level, we mean if the bootloader gets corrupted. Because the bootloader gets corrupted, there is uh, there are not a lot of ways to uh, fix it yourself. Because uh, anybody who has worked on the electronics platform would actually know that bootloader is not, you can, there is no software way to write the bootloader. You will have to use a JTAG or ICSP programmer and you have to write the bootloader through that. So, uh, I mean, I think that answers the question why the brick thing happens and yeah, how you can recover from it. Yeah. So, the fast boot uh, cable that you are saying is something that a lot of uh, chipsets have this configuration that when you are connecting the USB, the fourth pin is grounded it boots into a hidden partition. Okay, okay. So, from there you can reflash your bootloader or your kernel and then you can get, revive your device. Okay, okay. And uh, one more question. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, say for example, I am developing a mobile phone or modifying the... Yes. Uh, modifying an operating system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you find any challenges in terms of privacy policies or regulations uh, so, how far? Uh, I mean, at the uh, individual level the or as, at an organization level? At the individual level, I don't think you will face a lot of problems. Yeah, not at an individual level, more from the organizational level. From organizational level, so if you want to, uh, like, what exactly do you want to do? If you want to sell a custom uh, firmware. So, say, assume I want to uh, develop something like solidly secure with no backdoors and. Uh, a a solid like system yeah. without no backdoors. Secure, solid, secure system. Solid, secure system. Uh, so, uh, whether the vendor who has actually made the phone will object to that or something like that? Yeah, uh, and also in terms of uh, organizational policies, privacy policies. So, how far does a developer or a... Uh, I mean, how you want to ask that how many, how much the lawyers uh, poker stick around the developers? Yeah. yeah. So, they do poker stick around a lot with the developers because if it uh, does uh, somehow hamper legitimate interest of the vendor, they will. Okay. As an individual developer, I feel it, uh, the ecosystem is uh, slowly becoming very conducive. Because, uh, like, uh, Sony uh, uh, used to help me, they still help me a lot because I used to develop on Sony phones and I don't have any association with Sony as such. But uh, uh, they used to help me, like, anytime I need any documentation, uh, if I need devices to test something on, so they need to provide me. And really, what am I doing? I'm making custom firmware which deletes Sony's firmware and installs mine one, and they were still helpful towards it. So that's fine. But as a as a organization, if you want to do it, obviously they will have some objections to that. So maybe the proper way to do it is what Cyanogen Inc is doing. Okay. Okay. Tie up with a hardware vendor and get it by default on some device. Okay. Thank you. And the session was really interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So uh, anything else? Like like I said, anything else you want me to cover uh, other than what else I what I have covered? If it's possible, I can. Uh, how do you do this kernel debugging in this? Uh, suppose you want to add the IP table support. 
Yeah, yeah. So, how do you do the debug? Like in uh, how you do the kernel debugging is uh, Linux, we have GDB and all, and we can connect and we can do that, right? I think I have a device. Uh, I will just show you. Yeah, so I have a device connected. So I do ADB shell, and uh, I can just do. So there you have your KMSG. Yeah. So, is there something similar to that here? Because oh, that. Uh, that uh, I don't think would be available. Uh, would be possible, like doing a breakpoints on the kernel level code. Yes. Yeah. No, that won't be possible. I. I mean, as far as my experience is, it is not. But if you have a, a developer board uh, and you have got UART connections to it, then it will be possible because you need uh, hardware interrupts for it. Right. Uh, like. I think you have some experience with developer board, so you will need hardware interrupts to actually uh, debug the kernel. But uh, via USB connection, you can't have hardware interrupts. I mean, this is I'm saying, uh, for, yeah? Yeah, you can uh, do it via KMU. You can do it. It's the same or it's something different than. <laughs> See, for KMU, you need uh, an abstraction of the hardware in the first place. Okay, so you have, if you get a emulator for uh, this thing, uh, for ARM uh, architecture, then only you are able to do that. So uh, you will have some issues because you are going to run KMU on a 64-bit machine and you want the kernel of ARM uh, device to be debugged. So there could be some issues. I'm not uh, very familiar with this thing because uh, my experience has been mostly uh, working on devices that are already built. So I have a developer board at my place, and you can actually do uh, this uh, kernel breakpoint, uh, debugging the kernel by breakpoints, if you have a UART connection to the chip itself, so that you can uh, do interrupts via hardware, and th that is possible. Uh, anything else? Okay, so uh, I guess that will uh, wrap it up.